Back in the podcast, happy to be joined by Mike North, uh, the NFL's Vice President of Broadcast Planning. Uh, and I've gotten to know Mike over the last few years, particularly because I'm a little bit of a schedule nerd and I've written and talked a lot about the schedule and, and all that. So I thought it would be good to have Mike on this week, mainly to discuss the first ever Black Friday game. And, you know, Mike, I uh, one of the things that I noted in my column this week is that it's it's so odd, so many things that are happening with Amazon. But when you think about it, I covered the Thursday night game. The game was twice delayed by a drone over the stadium. And I thought, you know, first of all, you never would have even, nobody even heard of a drone 15 years ago. But also, nobody ever thought that a big package of games with a huge game like Cincinnati at Baltimore would be being put on by a uh, a big tech monolith and not one of the networks. And, and it's just things have changed so rapidly in this world that, you know, I'm writing sentences that 15 years ago I never would have written before. Like, you know, Amazon is the big tech company that ships packages everywhere and also has Al Michaels in the booth to do the Ravens and the Bengals. It's just life is a little bit weird these days in the media world. It's been an interesting journey uh, for years, right? This wasn't just the last year or two that Amazon became an option for us. You'll remember we've tried some streaming, uh, some over-the-top broadcasts in the past. We had Yahoo jump in there once. I think yeah. we had Verizon jump in there once. And, you know, people don't remember Amazon's been a Thursday night partner for years. They were part of that TriCast model where it was on broadcast and it was on NFL Network and it was on Amazon. And I think, uh, you know, senior leadership at our shop, the commissioner, Brian Rollapp, Hans Schroeder, were encouraged by, you know, the viewership that was coming from Amazon for the Thursday night package as part of the TriCast. And it led to this notion that maybe someday they could be, you know, the package holder exclusively. And there was certainly some hand wringing and a lot of consternation and it wasn't a decision made uh, haphazardly. But um, I think you're seeing, you know, the results this year, our fans have become more accustomed. I think we've all understood now. Uh, how to find Amazon, where to find Amazon. Maybe we could find it, but we'd have to help our parents find it. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. now the fans are finding it and you can see the numbers are going up. And look, there's a certain amount of serendipity to land on a game like Baltimore Cincinnati in you know mid to late season that's going to be so impactful. Uh, obviously, the story coming out of it is, is the injury to Burrow, but we, going into it, um, yeah, it was about as uh, big as we could have hoped for when we put that game on the schedule in May. So, Mike, explain for those who don't recall all of the, uh, you know, all of the various uh, things that went along with making a game on a Friday on Thanksgiving weekend, which the NFL is, to the best of my knowledge, you've never had a game on Friday of Thanksgiving weekend. Sure. And I wonder if you can just run down what exactly happened to make that possible? It started during the negotiations with Amazon um, as they were venturing into being a viable contender and, and then, you know, a, a finalist for the Thursday night package. They saw that there was an opportunity to have their package extend from week two all the way through week 17, but they would have had to skip week 12. They would have had to skip Thanksgiving. And so they started asking about, is there a way for us to get into the Thanksgiving weekend? As as you know, uh, football and Thanksgiving are, are, are synonymous. Our viewership numbers yeah. for our Thanksgiving games uh, are outstanding. Those two games in Dallas and Detroit every year, are two of the top three, top four, top five most viewed games of the season every year, no matter what, throughout the records, Thanksgiving and football go together. And so Amazon was looking for a way to get into that weekend if they could. Uh, Friday became a discussion point. There's uh, certainly other sporting events on that day. It's not truly a national holiday. Some of us have to work, but uh, 
a lot of us are kind of sitting around and whether we're shopping or uh, just sleeping off the turkey, it, it became an opportunity there where um, Amazon was interested and we thought there was a window where, you know, on an already pretty thin week, we've got to stretch these 16 games across now, three games on Thursday, one on Friday. We're looking for the big doubleheader game Sunday afternoon, a good Sunday night, a good Monday night. Flexible scheduling would be challenging, always challenging in week 12 because of how much inventory is already allocated to other windows. So finding a game for Friday, you know, it's got to come from somewhere and it was going to thin out everybody else just a little. But uh, the scheduling team felt confident to represent uh, the commissioner and to Brian and Hans that we could make it work. Um, It'll be a good first test for us all. But I I think the awareness is there. That's step one. And then it's going to be, you know, how good is the game? Uh, how impactful it is, and uh, we'll learn from this and and go from there. But you had to pass, the league had to pass a new rule to basically make it possible to add inventory this year, right? To 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 add extra games on short weeks. Yeah, the, the short weeks is the key. You've got it right. Um, the, the league, you know, got the rights to pull games from other packages and find other windows like a black Friday uh, or nine 30 AM, you know, international games or wherever else we end up finding homes for our games and our fans want to see them. We, we got the right to deploy the games in that manner uh, in the most recent round of media deals. But your, your point is right. What we had as Amazon extended to a 15 game season, now 16 games, every team in the league could only play one short week game. So Sunday right. to Thursday, Sunday to Friday. So in order for us to find a home, find two teams who could play on Black Friday, we had to get creative. And what ended up happening was ownership voted to allow teams to play multiple short week games. That's new this year. So this is the first season we've got teams who are playing more than one short week. And we committed to them that we would spread them out. We wouldn't do them too close together. We wouldn't uh, use the buy in the wrong place, whether you got the two short weeks and you got the buy in between them, or you got your two short weeks up early and your buy later. Um, Again, first year learning as we go, certainly we'll solicit feedback and they won't be shy about giving it to us, to the clubs that uh, did have to double up on their short weeks. But um, that allowed us to take a team like the Jets and have them in a Thursday night game and then also in a Friday game. Obviously, in you know April and May, we thought Aaron Rodgers was going to be their quarterback, and we thought uh, the Jets were going to be relevant and interesting by the time we got to Week 12. Uh, they are both still relevant and interesting, even if Aaron Rodgers isn't the quarterback. And you know, putting a division game into Black Friday also, again, nothing's a guarantee in this league, but all but ensures that the game's going to matter. Teams are going to play hard. It's going to mean something to somebody. So that was sort of the strategy. Find that right mix of uh, priority, brand awareness, playoff relevance, teams that we think are going to be in in contention, you know, second half of the season. And also, you know, two big markets, you know, New York and uh, us partnering with the retail giant in this space and the retail capital of the world in New York kind of had some synergy, made some sense. I believe Amazon's going to have a little presence in the Macy's Thanksgiving parade the day before. Um, there were a lot of different touch points where New York felt right. And then looking for an opponent, um, you know, Dolphins Jets have decades of history and hopefully they give us another exciting one on Friday. Would you explain also the time involved? Because you you have limits to the window that you can play the game in. Explain that. Yeah, the National Football League does not play games on Friday nights due to high school and Saturdays due to college. Uh, after the first Friday in September until the third Saturday in December. So we won't play uh once we get into mid-September, we won't play Fridays and Saturdays. And once we get down into the late season, um, what we said was, or what the public law actually says, is that uh, we'll stay out of the primetime window. We'll stay out of Friday nights um, and Saturday nights, Saturday afternoons and Saturday nights. So as we started looking at Friday, talking to the legal team at our shop, um, talking to Washington, D.C., uh, felt like there was a window there kind of late afternoon. Uh, We know it's a college football day. There's going to be college football at noon that day. There's going to be college football at eight o'clock that night. 
Uh, and, and there's going to be college football in the afternoon too. But uh, if we slide into the afternoon there, that three o'clock three o'clock time slot, again, not a national holiday, but kind of a national holiday. So we'll see what uh, what kind of viewership we get. We'll see how competitive the game is. We'll see how the fans find it and follow it. This one will be interesting, as I, as I think you hinted at. This one's in front of the Amazon paywall, so you don't need to be an Amazon Prime subscriber like you do right. for the rest of the Thursday night package. So anybody who's got Amazon, you know, you open the app and the game's going to be there. You go to Amazon.com on your computer, the game's going to be there. So I think a lot of people are going to find it, and uh, we'll see what kind of viewership and reaction we get. Um, and certainly continue to talk with, you know, our friends at college football and uh, our friends in Washington, D.C., and make sure that we're we're in the right window that day. Look, I, I think one of the things that, in my opinion, I didn't know that this was going to happen, but one of the things that Amazon has sort of taken on is a challenge. They just didn't want to do a regular telecast. They wanted to do something now that they have established with this thing, Amazon Prime Vision. I think that's what it's called, where uh, I wrote about this a couple of weeks ago that, you know, where they take uh, on defense and they try to give you after by using artificial intelligence who they think is going to blitz, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes and they draw a red circle around the guy. And or multiple guys, sometimes they don't draw any red circles because they don't think anybody's going to blitz. And, you know, in talking to Amazon, I thought it was really interesting when I asked uh, Sam Schwartzstein, the uh, the guy behind this. And I said, w basically, what do you do for an encore? And he goes, well, we're going to figure out something new to do next year. There's going to be some new kind of tech gadget to do. And I just said, that's cool. Nobody is really reinventing the wheel in in television. It's it's they're all good shows, obviously, but Amazon's taking a bunch of chances and it's kind of fun. And I don't know how you guys in the league office look at it, but what have you thought of that? I think fun is the right word. I think we're always looking uh to partner, you know, with the broadcasters and try to figure out which innovation that comes next becomes uh, you know irreplaceable i mean you mentioned a few years ago we never would have thought that you know we'd be broadcasting games on a retail website a few years ago we didn't used to have skycam you know for our games and now it's ubiquitous a few years before that the yellow first down line wasn't yeah. a thing watching NFL games. And now you can't imagine watching a game without it. So every time there's a new innovation, uh, a new production technique that our partners want to try, want to experiment with, uh, we've got a whole team of people led by Ani Bose and Blake Jones who uh, talk to the partners, talk to the officiating department, our player health and safety folks, the football operations team. Can we find a way to provide our fans with a new angle, a new wrinkle, a new audio source? Uh, and I think some of this data and analytics stuff kind of slots right in there. It's not for everybody. Um, you know, I've definitely talked to some people who don't like all the lines and circles over their football. Um, but for us nerds who really are fascinated by um, the trends and the analytics and some of the AI that goes into some of the predictive stuff, it, it's amazing. And Amazon's the perfect home for that. You've got a you know, regular broadcast, just like you're used to seeing. It sounds and feels just like an NFL broadcast. Al Michaels certainly helps when he's on the microphone. Fred Gadelli produced it that first year. Like, that's a good way to ensure that it's going to look and sound like an NFL game. Yeah. But you've yeah. got alternate broadcasts, right? You've got the stats feed like you're talking about. You've got uh, Hannah and Andrea doing a feed for themselves. You've got the guys from Dude Perfect. You've got LeBron. Um, there's so many other ways that Amazon's been able to experiment just based on their platform. And I think you said it right. It's fun. It's interesting. Uh, I don't want to say everybody's copying them because some of this came earlier, but these ideas of the alt casts is is not new, right? Peyton and Eli have been great for the last couple of years. Right. The has been doing stuff around uh, the college football national championship, whether it's the Homer feed, if that's what they call it, where they've got, you know, the University of Georgia guys and the Ohio State yeah. guys. Um, th there's no shortage of of interesting things we can try, and our fans will tell us, you know, what's relevant and, and what they're not interested in. 
Mike, let's uh, get into a couple of other quick topics. Uh, let's talk about Joe Burrow. So Cincinnati was going to be a big chunk of the last month or so of the season. They're on Monday Night Football in Week 13 at Jacksonville. They have one of those TBD games against Minnesota in Week 15. That's You're trying to determine which three games are going to be played on Saturday. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And you pick from a pool of how many? Five. Five. Okay. So, uh, and then week 16, Saturday, national game at Pittsburgh. And then week 17, they're in the doubleheader window at Kansas City, which, you know, has been an absolutely fantastic game with Burrow dueling Mahomes. So how much does the Burrow injury hurt? And can you see any of these games being flexed? Look, that's the point of flexible scheduling. Um, we'll see what happens. There's still a lot of football to be played, and you know that the Bengals aren't going to shut it down. I mean, they're still in this thing. What are they, half a game out of the seven seed? Uh, nobody's going to feel sorry for them, and um, they'll get the next man up, and they'll be ready to go. But there's no question losing a guy like Burrow Hurts, that's, you know, one of the risks that the scheduling team faces every year in April and May when we're putting this puzzle together, which of these games do you deploy early in the season because you're worried that they might not hold up if you save them for too late? And which of these games do you feel pretty good about saving for December when you got to figure these teams are going to be playing for something? And yeah, you mentioned it four, three or four Bengals games on national television in December sure seems to imply that the scheduling team thought since he was going to be there, um, they still are. I don't think there's going to be a rush to judgment. I don't think we're going to change anything today, but yeah. certainly keep our eyes up and and let's see what happens to the Bengals over the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, with the 18 week season and the extra playoff team now, seven out of 16 get in that seven seed. You know, if you're hovering around 500 in December, you're in it and they're yeah. hovering around 500 in December. So they're in it. If they can get a game or two, I'm sure they're going to look at teams you know, like the Jets who, you know, lost their quarterback but didn't end the season and the defense carried them for a while and they're in this thing too. So um, disappointing, you know, sad for him, heartbreaking for, uh, you know, Bengals fans, but uh, certainly the other 15 teams in the AFC aren't going to give them any sympathy and um, let's see what happens over the next couple of weeks before we write them off. Mike, the, the uh, you have not flexed – I believe have you flexed anything yet this year? I'm we moved to... a we moved a Lions Buccaneers game to 425. Technically right. not flex, but same yeah. idea. Trying to get a game into a bigger yeah. national window. Uh, that was earlier in the season when they both got off to good starts. But no, haven't flexed for Sunday night football yet. Uh, Monday night flex officially becomes an option. Thanksgiving weekend and Thursday night flex officially becomes an option the following week. So uh, have not flexed yet on Sunday night. Uh, due in large part, I think, to the fact that, you know, we've we've been in the first half of the season. Uh, I know a lot of people were wondering if maybe Bears Chargers was a good candidate for flexible scheduling. Um, you know, certainly didn't know that Justin Fields was going to miss the game. Uh, but it's hard to tell any team that, you know, you're no longer relevant, that you're not playing for anything in week eight. You know, it was only last year, right, that Detroit was out to a one and six start and went into the final week of the season playing for a playoff spot. So, Nobody's out of it, I don't think, in our minds in week eight. Uh, yeah. Bears-Chargers was still relevant, was still a good game. Uh, Jets-Raiders the following week, we took some, I think, good-natured grief for sticking with mini Denver for this weekend two weeks ago when we didn't flex out of it. And now that game looks pretty interesting and pretty compelling. So it's early season. Hard to say anybody's out of it. Um the bar for flex maybe has shifted a little. Maybe it's a little bit higher than we're used to. I think that's due in part to the fact that, you know, we've got multiple partners now for flexible scheduling. So it's not just about solely what's best for Sunday night. It's about what's the right way to dole out these appearances for all of our teams across Sunday night, Monday night, and Thursday night. Still trying to, you know, stick to our principles. Um, you know, the game really needs to be, you know, no longer have playoff implications not as compelling as we thought isn't a reason to get out of it, but no longer relevant. Maybe that's a reason to get out of it. What can you get into? CBS and Fox get to protect games. We've got some limits about where. Don't you get? Don't you? Don't you have each network 
gets to protect a minimum of one per week? Uh, a maximum, uh, an exact a maximum of one. Yeah. CBS yeah. and Fox each get to protect a game each week. So when you look at the schedule and you say, oh, why don't they just move that game to Sunday night? It's potentially because CBS or Fox protected it. So, yeah. Look, we're we'll flex when we need to. There's no question about it. Um, haven't flexed yet. There's been a few years where we hadn't flexed at all. I think twice in the last four or five years. You know, if the crystal ball is that clear in May and all the Sunday night games hold up, then we don't need to flex. But as we go down the stretch here, we've certainly got our eyes on a couple. And uh, let's see what the next couple of weeks bring. And uh, if the mood is right and everybody agrees, um, yeah, won't be won't be scared to pull the trigger if we have to. Mike, uh, what are the rules as to when you have to the length of time that you have both on Monday night and on Thursday night uh, that you you know the amount of time you have to give teams. Yeah, look, we give teams a lot of notice. Like if we think four or five weeks down the road you're a candidate for flex, either flexing out of Sunday night or flexing into Sunday night, you'll get a heads up from our office. Nobody's going to be blindsided by this. They'll know we're talking about it. We meet with the commissioner regularly and kind of do some aim high steering, some looking ahead to what might be coming down the pike. So uh, we can flex. We'll make flex decisions. We'll make flex changes for Sunday nights on two weeks notice until we get to mid-December. 13 uh, days, right? Yeah, yeah, 12, 13 days, exactly. Yeah. Um, same thing for Monday nights, two weeks out. So right after week 12, we'll decide on the Monday night of week 14, right after week 13, we'll decide on the Monday night for week 15. So two weeks out for most Sundays, two weeks out for most Mondays, four weeks out for Thursdays, just right. because of the change. Uh, and then as we get, uh, into the final weeks of the season, we'll make Sunday afternoon and Sunday night changes on only one week notice, as you know better than anybody, when you get down to the end like that, two weeks out, you make a decision, and then this team loses and that team wins, and suddenly the game you thought was for all the marbles now no longer has playoff implications. We don't want to be in that situation. So final three, four weeks of the year, we can do some Sunday changes on only one week's notice. So you have already determined, for instance, because you can change, you can flex on Monday night weeks 12 through 17, right? And so you've already decided in week, let's see, it's week 14, New England at Pittsburgh, that stays. For Thursday night, that one stays. That, that for Thursday was, night, yeah, excuse That change Thursday. would have had to have been made, yeah, yeah. two weeks ago. And, right. you know, two weeks ago, impossible to say that, you know, certainly Pittsburgh's going to be relevant. And, yeah. um, you know, these last that's two weeks, a good they game, haven't gone man. the way that's New England wanted them anyway. to go. Listen, that's a good game anyway. <laughs> Because it's Belichick, it's the Patriots, and it's everybody loves the Steelers around the country. You're going to get an audience for a Steelers game if you put it on national TV. That's our stream, whichever. So that that I didn't think. Now maybe you, have you already then also determined that the uh, uh, Chargers and the Raiders stay? That decision would need to be made after this weekend. But as we're sitting here today, I think we should expect that two teams with records right around the 500 mark yeah. playing, you know, for a game. You know, as we get late in the season like this, those division games, if you're hovering around 500, they almost become playoff games of their own, right? They're really kind of an yeah. elimination game. You could see getting to that week and the loser of Chargers Raiders might be out. So, yeah. you know, I think that's all we're looking for when you put a game on the schedule in May that by the time you get to it in December, one or both teams is is playing for something. Yeah. The last thing I would ask you, I'm really curious because I went to the game in Frankfurt, uh, Miami and Kansas City. Um, as you know, the, the fervor overseas for the NFL is pretty big. And, but I wonder, what have you found about the 930 window. I believe this year you had five games in the 930 window. And I wonder, do you see the day, maybe in the next media package, that you would have literally a package of games at 930 in the morning? Uh, however many, because look, I think at some point you'll probably increase the number of games you play outside the United States. So who knows? Maybe there's six or eight games 
that could be played conveniently uh, at at nine thirty in the morning Eastern time. So, what do you think of that window? Yeah, look, I might challenge you when you say played conveniently. It, it, it's not convenient. It's a challenge, uh, you know, both for yeah. the teams going over there and obviously for the scheduling team trying to find it. Um, but look, as a as a fan. I love it. I love waking up and there's football on and you go all day long. I know, you know, 12, 14 hours is a lot to sit in front of the couch, but um, as a fan, I love it as the league, like you said, has evolved its strategy around the international games. I think it stands to reason that the quality of some of those games is starting to tick up a little bit. It's no longer just, you know, volunteers or teams that have been awarded Super Bowls or playing in temporary facilities or however it was that Peter O'Reilly and the international team had to source home teams, designated teams for international games. Ownership voted and they passed a rule. Everybody's going to go. So, you know, that's how you end up with a Kansas City Chiefs game over there. We're going to get a Cowboys game or Eagles, 49ers. We're going to have all the big brands playing international games here, rotating across all 32. And, you know, whether by luck or by intention, some of those are going to be bigger maybe than, you know, we've seen in the past. Uh, There's going to be ones, look, a a good example, really, honestly, is Seattle, Tampa in Germany from last year. Right. When we put that game on the schedule, Seattle was a question mark. They just traded away Russell Wilson and Tom Brady had just retired. And yet Seattle, Tampa was going to be the Germany game. Then it turns into Tom Brady unretiring and Geno Smith comeback player of the year and Seahawks relevant again. And all of a sudden that became the biggest game we've ever had overseas. The previous year it was Packers Giants, the biggest game we've ever had overseas this year, Miami, Kansas City. I don't know what we do for an encore next year, but um, certainly the more windows we have and the more teams that have to go or are willing to go the more likely that we're going to stumble into a good one every now and then blind squirrel finds a nut, but uh, it's a challenge. No question for the schedule makers, but a a fun one and love, love waking up on those Sundays and right into live football. It's it, it makes a Sunday even better. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing and then I'm going to ask you one last question and let you go. So Mark Donovan, the uh, uh, president of the Kansas city franchise told me, the night before the game, he said, we don't want to wait eight years. We want to come back before then. Because, look, a lot of people say, oh, it's a pain in the rear end for these teams. And, of course, in a football sense, Andy Reid would like to play that game at Arrowhead Stadium, obviously. But for a future of football for the business of this franchise and for the business of the NFL, that was, I'll tell you what, that was, that was crazy over there with the, with the Kansas city uh, of buying a, or I'm sorry, outfitting a 250 foot yacht in Kansas city colors, putting their Super Bowl trophies on there, bringing Roger Goodell and Clark Hunt uh, to be sort of guest bartenders there. It just, you know, it just had the feel of something exceedingly festive. And Mark Donovan, I, I mean, look, you're not going to have to twist Clark Hunt's arm when you, when they have nine home games at some point. They're not going to want to give away the, a Tyreek Hill game, but, uh, you know, but you're not going to have any problem, I don't think, either four or six years down the road getting them to go again. That's one thing. But my other question is, and I should know this, but I don't, what, relatively speaking, is the difference between how many people watch that game at 9.30 in the morning on NFL Network versus would have watched that game, let's just say, at 4.25 Eastern time on a Sunday afternoon? First of all, how many people watch that game and what do you think the rating would have been had it uh, had you done it as a Sunday doubleheader game? When Kansas City volunteered, to your point, they volunteered. They were eager to go to Germany. They've got marketing rights over there. Yeah. Your point is is well taken. These clubs, whether they have played yeah. over there or not, are still marketing themselves 
over there. They have, you know, activations, they have shows, they have fan groups, they have jersey sales and team stores, I think. Like this is this wasn't just sudden. This was Kansas City spending years cultivating an audience in Germany and then paying it off with a visit. Any opponent that Kansas City would have brought over there with them would have been a phenomenal experience. And, you know, you and I talked about this way back when the schedule came out. We were talking about what was the right Kansas City game for kickoff. And I think folks were a little surprised that Detroit ended up in that time slot. They seem to have justified that selection. Um, But if Detroit's in kickoff and you're still holding a Philadelphia, a Cincinnati, Buffalo in your hand, those are probably heading to your point to our more traditional big windows. Um, We don't have a long history of sending division opponents over there. So you almost kind of backed into Miami as the opponent. You know, there were question marks around Miami back in May. Don't forget, we didn't know how healthy Tua was going to be. Um, right. Skylar Thompson was the quarterback in the wild card game. Like there were questions around them too. So not to say that this was, you know, a, a, a tier B game, if you will, for Kansas city, but it, it wasn't really one of the jump off the page games. And your point about the question about viewership is exactly why that game in Germany, uh, Chiefs dolphins drew a little over 10 million all in, um, a record for anything we've done in the nine thirty AM window. Uh, you know, you've been with the NBC family for a while, Sunday night games do twice that, you know, regularly. Yeah. And the Sunday afternoon games at 425, you get a big Dallas, a big Kansas City game in there. Uh, you're talking 23, 25, sometimes 28 million people. So, um, you know, it's all about, like we always say, these 272 games, these 272 assets that belong yeah. to our fans. We want to make sure we deploy them in the way so that, you know, fans can watch the games that they care about. And, yeah, we probably uh, would have done 2x, 2.5x if that Dolphins right. Chiefs game had been on a Sunday afternoon. But it would have been a different Chiefs game that would have been in that window. And it still would have probably been the most watched international game just with Kansas City and their allure and uh, all the excitement around that game. Um, I, I hope that's a you know a, a, another bar that we can meet next year when we make next year's uh, international yeah. schedule, but that's all part of the calculus. And it all comes back just to tie it back to Black Friday. You know, we don't know what uh, the viewership's going to be on Black Friday. So, you know, you got to pick a game that maybe isn't one of the top five games of the year, at least as we look at the list in May. But it's not coming out of, you know, the tier at the bottom where you're guessing about which teams may or may not be relevant. So, um, you know, trying to thread that needle, find the right mix for all of our partners, for all of our fans, for all of our clubs. You know, asking a lot of Miami. Miami's playing in Germany, coming back, playing on Black Friday for the first time, coming back and making a run at a division title. Um, you know, this is not without challenges for for everybody. Obviously, the schedule makers will tell you how hard it is for them, but um, we'll, we'll always figure it out. And uh, our fans generally seem to find our games wherever we put them. Um, that's a testament to them. And we'll keep trying to find good windows to put our best product in. Mike North, Vice Vice President of Broadcast Planning for the National Football League. Really appreciate you taking some time and uh, educating me and educating the people who will listen. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people right now who are in the car driving to grandma's house uh, in Thanksgiving week. And I guarantee you, because I've gotten a ton of emails about A, the Black Friday game, and B about the flexing situation and why have there not been many games flexed. So I appreciate you answering all those questions and good, good luck the rest of the way. And you know what, maybe Jake Browning will turn into, uh, will turn into Brock Purdy. You never know. (laughs) Maybe maybe he can date Taylor Swift. Who knows? We'll see. (laughs) Hey, listen, all the best to you, Mike. Thank you. Always good to talk to you, Peter. Take care. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.